Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Fowler from the International Biogeography Society. And in a few minutes, we're, uh, Suzanne Renner is going to give her talk on why did Humboldt fake the plant data in his Tableau Physique des Andes? And what about the data in his Tableau Physique des Îles Canaries? Um, and in the meantime, while everybody joins, we're just going to give a few minutes to connect so, and go over some upcoming upcoming other events for Humboldt Day. So firstly, thanks for joining us for International Humboldt Day, which is a series of independent biogeography focused events um, during this week and they're held around the world. It's partly overseen by the International Biogeography Society, but mostly it's led by um, independent organizers. So thanks. And just to go over a couple of the upcoming ones, tomorrow we have uh, my little pictures right over the title, is Humboldt's Legacy Through the Eyes of Chinese Historians and Ecologists, and that will be in Chinese. Um, we'll record these if we can, and then add subtitles for the videos on Humboldt Day channel in, in the future, but if you can join for that. And then a QA with the Editor-in-Chief Michael Dawson, Journal of Biogeography. And then the 15th has one from Sri Lanka, and one from Turkey, and one from South America, uh, I think Chile. So, and there's a lot more events during the week. So I just invite you to check them out at humboldtday.org events. Welcome everybody to uh, this humble event. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Susan Renner, Professor Susan Renner, that today um, she gave us a, a, a good, excellent news that she become an honorary prize of the natural history in Berlin that was funded back in 1773. And one of the curiosities that links quite nicely with this event is that one of the uh, founder members was humble, uh, apart from others. So I think that this, uh, it's a perfect link to just introduce our great speaker today. Suzanne, all for you. Thank you very much. And let me share my screen. And let me just say, I'm gonna switch off my video just to prevent any accidents here with the uh, connection, okay? Okay, so I'm very happy to talk about this uh, analysis, the second part of which is uh, entirely new data. And I look forward to your comments and questions, particularly since I know from emails that several experts on Humboldt are among the listeners today. So in my research, I have dealt with the collections of Humboldt and Bonplan for a long time because my doctoral research and also publications afterwards dealt with the systematics and reproductive biology of Melastomataceae, a uh, family that was of particular interest to Humboldt and Bonplan. I have also done field work near uh, San Gabriel de Cachoeira, which is about 440 kilometers from where Humboldt and Bonplan spend much time or considerable time on the studying the Cassiquiari area. Here's me. And I've published on the history of botanical exploration, Amazonian Ecuador. So, so my, my interest in Humboldt and Bonplan goes back a long way. The most famous um, diagram produced by Humboldt is undoubtedly this one. And if we now focus in on the section that was marked here in the red square, we can see some of the names that are written there, namely Dactylus, Agrostis, Bromus, Panicum, Avina nivalis, a name that was never published, Melica, Stipa, Juncus, and everybody, even those of you who have nothing to do with botany, will recognize that Panicum and Stipa and Avina are all grasses or uh, families that look like grasses, like Juncaceae, Sapporaceae, okay? So in order to understand what this means for a botanist seeing these grass genera there, we will take a little brief detour, four slides to the Austrian Alps. So this is Obergurgel. This is the highest little village in Austria, the highest located little village. And we walk up through the rhododendron and we walk up when we come to this grassy area, it's super well researched, it's the Beilstein area. This is a mesolithic, uh, there's research showing that this was there were Mesolithic fireplaces, people were grazing sheep there 9,000 years ago. And then we walk up a little further and we take a good look around. 365, 300 whatever degrees, 360. Uh, 
I will email it to you. Okay, now it's already more than 360. Okay, so did you see any grasses? No, because the plants that occur at such high altitudes are Ranunculus, saxifages, Salix herbertia, Salini type things, and other, you know, everybody who has ever been in the Alps, even if you're not a botanist, knows that there are these tiny little plants oppressed to the ground, but certainly no grasses. And this was, of course, noted by others all along. There is no mountain in the world in which grasses form the highest vegetation zone. Their physiology just isn't adapted to that kind of uh, bio biotope. And as early as 1831, Francis Hall, a naturalist who spent several years in Ecuador and collected many plants at high altitude, felt puzzled by Humboldt's description of high altitude vegetation zones in the tableau physique and concluded that the reverse is the fact, as the grasslands are surmounted by the region of alpine plants, which extends to the limit of perpetual snow, as we just saw in the Austrian Alps. And I will come back to the point of other botanists and biologists knowing full well that Humboldt did not have his species and vegetation zones straight. Why did Humboldt felt a need to fake plant names and distribution ranges that many knowledgeable people at the time must have known he did not have and did not exist, that did not exist? So, of course, to understand this, we have to think about the feat that he and Bonplan and their team accomplished by climbing as high as they did on this, at that time, world highest mountain. The team consisted of Humboldt, Bonplan, and uh, Carlos Montufa, and of course, um, illustrated here in a famous painting as a detail, unnamed uh, people bearing instruments, carrying instruments, and accompanying the team. And the most important instrument here is the sextant and the barometer for determining the height. Okay, and we know from Humboldt's diary of which you see here, just a few uh, excerpts, and this runs many pages in French, but anybody can look it up online, what, how difficult it was to climb up there, what difficulties they encountered, that it was snowing and they had to turn around, etc., etc. They did not collect plants. And we also know this from Montufa's diary, which is much shorter, but essentially says the same thing. Uh, that very few plants were seen and at high altitudes, none, okay? So how did Humboldt make his diagram? The first sketch originated when he was when he and Bonplan and the team from Montufa were waiting for their ship to Mexico. This was eight months after the climb. They were sitting there in Guayaquil and he occupied himself with you know, writing letters and you know, congesting and digesting the the things they had seen and drafting this famous diagram. We see it here and because he sent this diagram with via Montufa's father to Jose Caldas with the request to also send it on to Jose uh, Celestino Mutis, botanist with whom he had been discussing uh, the vegetation of the Andes over a year earlier on his way down south. Uh, this thing survived. It is now in the National Library in Bogota. And if we zoom in, we see in this draft, Bromos, Avena, Stipa, Melica, and we see the Région de Cramine, the grass song. Okay, so back in Paris, where, you, where they arrived in August 1804, Humboldt passed this sketch to two artists and an engraver and went off to work in Italy, having pre before that <laughs> attended important events because he and Montufa and the team really were the stars there. This is a wonderful painting where Humboldt and Montufa are attending the coronation of Napoleon and Josephine, Napoleon coronating, uh, crowning, excuse me, uh, Josephine, okay? Mon Bonplan does not seem to have moved in these circles. Anyway, uh, Bonplan goes off to Italy with Gay Lusac and does important research. There's no time to go into this. He meets Bonplan in Pisa and again in Berlin in May and August 1805 and returns to Paris in 1807. During this time, no new plants were unpacked and determined and worked on by uh, Humboldt and Bonplan. Bonplan must have did some work, beginnings, began some work, but you know, Really, really difficult to identify these plants from their collections. I don't have time to go into this, but we could certainly 
take up this point. So in Rome, in 1805, Humboldt writes the preface for his Essai sur la géographie des plantes, of which this famous diagram, of the, the, the text that accompanies the famous diagram. And he describes the method by which he made the diagram. And let me just translate the German here. Compass in hand, um, uh, and based on our notes, I entered the names of the plant species into the profile, those plants that have very specific altitudinal ranges. Each name is written at the place according to the meter and toise scale shown. Where a species has a broad altitudinal range, this is expressed by its name being shown diagonal, okay? And it's super interesting that he mentions the compass here because the compass is of course not relevant. The relevant instrument here would have been the barometer. barometer. But anyway, it is very clear that this description does not reflect the truth. Humboldt did not write in these grasses these grasses were never seen, much less collected at, at high altitudes. This text is wrong. And let's see whether he corrected himself later on as the names became available through the research of Kunt and other botanists. And the simple answer is no. Here's a version uh, of, the, of the diagram accompanied by European mountains, the Mont Blanc and the Spanish mountain. And by the way, for the European mountains, he correctly shows the Salix herbartia and Salini acaulis. And for the Chimborazo, no, he sticks with the grass zone and he paints in the Latin name of one plant. He paints this in this plant is not, shown, is not found, does not occur on the Chimborazo and it does not occur at snow line. It is, a, it is an Andean high altitude plant, okay? And in an it other diagram published in Paris in 1824 and slightly modified with colors slightly modified in 1827. There are numerous other plant names. Okay. Oopa, sorry. And as many of you will know, the details of which plant names are in all four versions or in all versions of this drawing have been, excuse me, have been analyzed by Pierre Moret and his colleagues in this wonderful paper. Humboldt's Tableau Physique Revisited, which came out in the Proceedings of the National Academy in 2019, and which has excellent online supporting material where every single name is commented and researched and, and, and documented. And the gist of the matter is that no species names appear in all four versions, and the altitudinal ranges shown often differ by a thousand meters from those given for the same species by Kunt. And in this final drawing published or designed a few years before Humboldt died in 1859, we find the grass zone still there, very prominent. One has to understand the physical difficulties of doing this type of research. And I think this uh, photo of Humboldt's last writing pen, one of Humboldt's last writing pens given to his servant, Johann Seibert, really illustrates beautifully uh, the difficulties. Yeah, I mean, I don't need to. I, I should say the lack of paper, the difficulty of writing anything, the difficulty of identifying the material. And also, I mean, look at this. I put in the world's oldest pencil, pencils, humble pencil, which had been invented in 1790. Sometimes they use pencil. Most of the time they use this, this uh, uh, pen and ink. It is really clear to all of us that this research was very difficult, regardless of the physical difficulties, Humboldt, he was then 35 years old, clearly lied about how he drew his diagram of the ends. Okay, so let's, me, let's move on to the Pico de Taidi, also among the highest mountains on earth, which Humboldt and Bonplan also climbed and about which Humboldt also published a tableau physique. So how about that? Humboldt visited, Humboldt and Bonplan visited the Taidi on the 21st and 22nd of June, 1799, spent the night at almost 3,000 meters, and then the next morning at three, started the hike up. They were accompanied by the French vice consul, his secretary and English gardener, various Spanish officials, as well as local guides. 
Humboldt and Bonplan collected 16 plants during their week on the Canary Islands, many of them in the botanical garden, and very few during their visit to the Tidy, but they did collect a key species, namely the violet that occurs at very high altitude. Here's the specimen that Bonplan collected at 3,400 meters. Humboldt also sat and sketched on the spot a view of the interior edge of the crater as it presented itself in the descent by the Eastern break. It is fabulous that he you know, used his time in this way and really he did look at the stones this is all described in his various texts. He did spend time there and they did yeah, make incredibly important early observations. So how the heck did he draw this diagram with so many plant names given that they collected one or two species on the tidy? Well, as indicated, this is from both Tableau Physique des Îles Canaries from 1817. Well, as indicated in the legend, this diagram is based on the observations of Leopold von Buch and Christian Smith. Leopold von Buch and Christian Smith had visited the tidy 16 years after Humboldt during a six month stay on the Canary Islands. Buch made a 450 collections, sadly, most of them burned in Berlin in 1943 and Smith made 400 collections that are now in the British Museum with duplicates in Copenhagen and Oslo. And they published a, a very important uh, uh, papers in the book on their observations. Book published these three long treatises and here, uh, Smith who unfortunately died the next year, left his diary which was uh, edited and is accepted, uh, it can be seen uh, in the rare book reading rooms in Copenhagen, for instance, where I saw it. This is just a facsimile, facsimile of one page. But all this was published after Humboldt's diagram, which after all came out in 1870. So how did Humboldt do it? He did it, he did his diagram, the names in his diagram, by using the correspondence that Leopold von Buch, the letters that Leopold von Buch sent him immediately after returning in October, after, I mean, sometime after October 1815. Humboldt and Bonplan were friends. They had met at the School of Mines in Freiburg in 1791. They traveled together in Italy where they climbed the Vesuvius. They worked together in Berlin in 1806. Von Buch stayed with Humboldt in Paris in 1810. They spent a week together in Verona in 1822, and Humboldt attended Buch's funeral in 1853. And one can easily distinguish, this has now been digitized, okay, one can easily distinguish Bonplan's writing, excuse me, Humboldt's writing and von Buch's writing. It's, von Buch is very legible. So here is an enlarged version of the, one of these pages where Buch sends the upper boundaries on Tenerife, obere Grenzen in Tenerife, observed ziemlich genau, beobachtet ziemlich genau, observed quite exactly. And here is the measure and the toise and the Paris foot, and here is the plant name. And so he mentions this violet and also the broom, the famous broom, and this material is documented by these collections. Okay. So Buch's publications mention 560 species but his letters to Humboldt provide fewer names, understandable because they had to work up this material, right? So Humboldt's diagrams contains 223 names, 100% from book, from these letters. 27 of these names appear two, three or four times and are marked by colored stars, 20 of them. It became too confusing, but I think the point, the point I wanted to make is that the uh, many names, that he put in two or three times are at the same altitude. It's not, yeah, okay. It's not lower limits and upper limits of that species because those data weren't available. So very, very few species did book, actually for two, did book indicate this is the lower limit and this is the upper limit as we saw it, okay? And for all the others, he essentially wrote down the name and said, okay, this is a species of the lower part of the mountain, and this is a species of the pine zone on the mountain, and Humboldt put this in correct, all right? Um, for the key species at the highest altitude, von Buch gives 3,381 meters in his letter, and, Buch, and, and Humboldt drew it, and drew it in the diagram quite correctly, I mean correctly. 
And for the broom, Book indicates this altitude, 3,130, and Humboldt put it in perfectly correctly. And of the 223 species names, there is only one which Humboldt put in about a thousand meters above what Book said where they saw and collected this plant. And this is this fescue. This fescue appears in the diagram about a thousand meters above the book saw it. And I think this is no chance because Humboldt had already committed to the grass zone before ever receiving the data. And as you know, Humboldt, excuse me, Humboldt essentially revolutionized uh, travel publishing, traveling literature. His papers came out at a fast pace. Here is this Relation Historique in Paris, 1814. The English translation in London came out the first, the same year. The American version came out one year later. And then there are all these other papers. I just put in a few examples here, all the way to the year he died, where he, I can't say it in any different words, he, he self-plagiarized a lot. He really repeated his observations again and again, understandably. And so he had committed to the grass zone already in 1814 here. Yeah, this is the English version, the English language version of 1814. In its present state, the island of Tenerife exhibits five zones of plants, which we may distinguish by the names, region of the vines, region of the laurels, the pines, the retama, aratama, this is misspelled, this is the broom, and the region of the grasses. And a little later, the grasses, which in the Alps and the Andes, touch immediately on the family, family, the group of the cryptogams, okay? And then later, the fifth zone, the grasses, yeah? Grasses above the broom, five zones, highest one, the grasses. And so he was really invested in having this grass zone at the highest altitude, just near the cryptogams. Smith in his 1815 diary says that he could not find Humboldt's grass zone on the tidy. He and von Buch appeared to have looked for that. They were fully aware that Humboldt was interested in having a, or had described a grass zone and they looked for it and couldn't find it. So von Buch's data and von Buch's and Smith's data are super interesting. And we can in fact use some of their data, particularly from the high altitudes to uh, investigate changes in the altitudinal ranges and the abundances of species today, 205 years after they visited. For example, this wonderful violet von Buch and also Humboldt himself collected it and saw it at 3,380 meters. It was the highest occurrence. Today it is at 3,700 meters. This represents an upward expansion of 319 meters in 204 years or about one meter 50 per year. Other plants such as this much mentioned broom, it, was, it had its highest occurrence in 1815 at 3,130. And today it is still at about that altitude. Essentially no change in altitudinal occurrence over the past 200 years. And with a team consisting of uh, colleagues from the University of La Laguna in Tenerife, and the head of the Tidy Park, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, site since 2007, and a historian working in Berlin on the edition of Humboldt's papers. Um, we have begun to investigate what can be made, what can be, what information can be squeezed out of von Buch and Smith's data and be compared with today's vegetation on the Tidy. There are many fewer goats than there were in Humboldt times, of course, there is a drastic climate change on which climate warming on which the Spanish colleagues have accumulated excellent data since the 1950s. There are more European rabbits and mufflons there in the process of being eradicated. So there are a lot of biotic changes that can be related to the changes in abundances and, and altitude of particular species. So here is the summary of my talk. Why did Humboldt fake the plant data in his tableau physique design? I think he invented all those letter names to illustrate his idea of climate, namely that climate causes species 
specific altitudinal zones. He needed to have particular names to make that idea, to, to, to make that idea come across. I have not understood why he insisted on a grass zone, given that he knew the Alps. He never correct, corrected his uh, tableau physique, but instead introduced further fakes in these later versions of the drawing as I showed you. What about the data in the tableau physique des Îles Canaries? The Latin names and altitudes are 99.9% .9 from books letters and are okay, except for the placement of that grass, the fescue, a grass, that fescue, a grass that Humboldt moved up by a thousand meter because from 1803 onwards, he was committed to grasses forming the highest vegetation zones on the world's mountains. Despite Book's clear 1815-1860 data, and despite you know, really having, yeah, despite these data, Humboldt insisted on the tidy grass zone until his death. And to end on a positive note, we are using von Book's and Smith's data to infer vegetation change since 1815. And Humboldt's observations and Bonplan's work is, of course, of tremendous importance that I'm not, you know, I'm fully aware of, as, as aware as anybody can be. But I cannot understand why he acted the way he acted when it came to these aspects, the species names and the grass zone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. That was that was a really interesting talk. So um, I am just going to go over for anybody who just joined us afterwards. I'm going to go over how to ask questions again. Um, oops. So maybe we'll share my screen quickly. So um, if you have a question you want to ask, just raise your hand. There's also, and we'll move, promote you to a panelist so you can ask. Suzanne in person. There's also this Q&A box um, that you can type your question in and we can ask it for you. So uh, with that, it looks like... There is um, one from Robert Whittaker. How wonderful. <laughs> um, and Rob, if you want to ask you... Uh, hang on. Do you want to ask your question in person, Rob? Or... <laughs> Did you say... Oh, and right now, sorry, Sita. I will now turn it over to Sita, who will... Um, go through the Q and A's. Thank you so much, Professor, for this very interesting talk. <laughs> now it's time for a Q and A session. And as Karen mentioned, while well, giving priority to the questions asked during the talk, you can continue to write your questions now, or you can raise your hand and ask your questions by yourself. And the first question is, coming from Scott Solomon and says, based on your assertion that Humboldt faked his data on alpine vegetation, do you question other observations, data and conclusions in other aspects of his extensive work? <laughs> That's a great question and certainly one that I'm turning around in my mind. The research on Humboldt is huge. Every aspect of his work is being analyzed and yet there are open questions. And this is one of them. My gut feeling is that probably he also exaggerated in other aspects of his work, but I have not myself investigated. Yeah, I have not looked, nor do I want to do that. I don't want to go through Humboldt's innumerable publications and find mistakes, okay? Great, thank you. <laughs> Robert Whittaker asks, fascinating talk. <laughs> Is there any evidence of similar problems in any other aspect? Okay, I, think, I think that question, I just tried to answer it. I suspect there must be, as is natural, no scientist who publishes a lot is without errors in there, somewhere in their data or conclusions. Okay. The next question is, come from Carmen. Yes, oh, 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. Humboldt himself says the table yeah. is... This is Carmen, thank you for the question. But it is actually incorrect to say that Humboldt's drawing only concerned all the Andes, because the later versions, which I've shown you, specifically concern the Chimborazo and are labeled Chimborazo. So I think we cannot, you know, get him out of the, <laughs> find an excuse because it's a painting of the Andes and the grass zone, even if the Latin names can say, okay, this is all the Andes, the grass zone, how do we excuse the invented grass zone? Thank you. And Pierre More wants to ask by himself. Ah, Pierre. Apologies, yes. sorry, I, my, my computer crashed, so I will, I will move yes. over. Oh, yeah, it's so nice to meet you finally. <laughs> Me too, so congratulations for your, uh, for the talk. Uh, and I'm very pleased that you have taken up this exciting and so intriguing mm -hmm. issue. And as to your, your last question, I, I, I do not under, understand it either. Um, I don't know. I think maybe uh, Hummel did not fake data. He made an error at the beginning. He made an error and then he, he was trapped in yes, this. Yes, error. yes, yes. He became trapped. And there is a very interesting detail because first I found that uh, paper by Colonel Hall, who criticized this uh, inverted um, zonation. And in a later, in his book on uh, Asie Centrale in 1843, um, Humboldt mentions Hall's paper, but not on that particular point. Yes. In return, he criticizes Hall just on a very, very marginal detail, an oh, error about yes. elevation. So he knew it, but he yes. didn't say nothing. Pierre, may I say something? This is so interesting. Von Buch and Humboldt spent much time together, as I mentioned in my talk, and they must have talked about it and von, about you know the zones there on the tidy. And Von Buch mentions Humboldt's drawing in one sentence in 1819 in a very vague way. You know, Von Buch must have known that this fescue, fescue was at the wrong altitude. He knew it. And they must have, I mean, one would think they would have talked about it. But yeah, the botanists, many botanists at the time, must have known there were grave errors. And, I, and Humboldt I, was trapped, like you say, Humboldt, self, I, I call this self plagiarizing, this is a harsh word. He, he was trapped in his initial error and didn't want to cor correct himself in these two issues, the wrong Latin names and the zone. Yeah, and, and I even wonder if, well, uh, Ulrich Pessler published a very, very interesting, very complete work about uh, the, the, this everlasting project of a new version of the a geography of plants, and he never uh, finished it. Maybe this problem, this error, was so uh, was like something that that uh, prevented a, a, a full uh, completion of the of the work. Thank you, Ulrich Pessler is one of my collaborators on this investigation of the book letters. Okay, it was in fact Ulrich Pessler who first alerted me to these letters. But I want to say one thing. When Humboldt was writing the preface of his essay de plan, okay, in Rome in 1805, and he was claiming that compass in hand, he wrote these names, he was lying. There was no need to claim this, that this, that he had said their compass. It is so interesting that he mentions the compass instead of the barometer. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thanks a lot for the, for the talk. Thank you. I see there are many other questions here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Stefan Beck, please. Ah, Stefan, how nice to have you here in the audience. <laughs> I 
Stefan, you're on mute at the moment. Okay, I will pick up one question about we wait for Stefan. Okay, the curator of the Oslo Herbarium, Charlotte Borcher, who is very interested in Kristen Smith, uh, asked me about the collections in the Oslo Herbarium, and I'm super interested. Our team is of, of people investigating the changes on the tidy. We are super interested in seeing as many duplicates as possible in Copenhagen, Oslo, and the British Museum. I'm already in contact with all three relevant curators. It's not easy. So does Carl Solomon want to- Stefan, Stefan, do you want to say something now? Yes, uh, Susanna, I was shocked her um, fate news. That's, that's with tr uh, Trump and all these terrible, terrible people who use this. I was horrified to hear that you use this uh, expression. Uh, that's not good. And the story is the people, as you know, were working with Claudia in the high Andes from Venezuela to Argentine. And there are a lot of process going up to the glaciers. That's, uh, we, you, have, you know about this. And uh, it's certainly okay to speak, not to speak on a grace zone. There's no grace zone, but what will you tell about zones? That's so difficult that but the grasses have important uh, uh, plants in the high ending areas. Thank you. This is wonderful. Please email me names. The names that Humboldt drew in there, Avena, Bromos, Melia, etc. Yes, are invented. Okay. They are invented. And he drew them in, and we could talk about other names. I'm just focusing on the grasses because he invented this grass zone touching on the crypto gas. I'm focusing on that because it is a key aspect. Moret, uh, Pierre Moret and his colleagues have investigated every plant name in the Tableau Physique des Ondes. It's in the online supporting material, which is so rich. I, in this talk, focused on the grasses because that to me is the craziest thing. This grass zone, which doesn't exist. No, I agree there is no grass zone. Nice to see you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> okay, so maybe we can have a few more questions here from the talk. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, there is another one from Scott Solomon. He continues ah. the question. He asks, do you think we can use any of his published observations about alpine vegetation as baseline data to compare with observations ma made in modern times. Yes, when there are collections. Pierre Moret and his colleague found that there are 31 species of plants collected in the, high, in the Ecuadorian mountains, four mountains. They did not only climb the Chimborazo, they climbed four mountains, they made 31 collections and two of these species represented in the collections did in fact move up in the Andes, okay? And in the tidy, they did collect the violet, Viola chiantifolia. It is documented by Bonplan's collection. It was documented for, you know, over 3,400 meters. And that can absolutely be used to infer vegetation change. Yes. Okay, thank you. William Friedman asks, Wombach was an incredibly smart natural historian. Is there any reason to believe that there might be letters or archival records from Wombach that note Humboldt's mistake about the grass zone? Ah, it's an excellent question. So far, the digitized material, which amounts to 30 pages in the PDF, I have that, of course, and there's much duplication because the people who photographed these letters, they were turning them around and photographing the back. Anyway, so far, I, and I can read this, we can read books, handwriting, it's perfectly legible. I have not found any evidence and also in the correspondent that is accessible to me so far, I have not found any discussion, which I suspect they must have had when they visited each other in Paris and in Verona, they spent a week together in Verona. I suspect they discussed the vegetation on the tidy, but I have not found 
any evidence in letters and in the publications, Humboldt stuck with the grass zone until he died. Thank you. It's a good question. Andre, the raised hand. Ah, yes, such, it's great to see some names here of people that I've known so long. Gerardo Aymar. <laughs> Herr Daum, sind Sie doch da? Andreas, please. Good, okay. Hello. Yes. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for, for taking my question. Let me just speak. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Renner. Um, I'm not qualified actually to ask a question because I missed most of the talk, but I did hear a previous version of it. So I, I do want to comment on it. And Zuzana, it's, um, you know, I'm a, I really am an admirer of yours. And I think you are right in everything you said. At the same time, there is a kind of holistic or philosophical dimension to your talk and which may reframe the judgment that you faked or lied to us. Maybe we are expecting something that was still in the making at its time, a quest for precision. Yes, yes. A mechanical objectivity, a trust in numbers. And you'll notice, of course, that I'm quoting yes. a colleague yes. who have written yes. about these yes. topics. And we tend to underestimate that there was a good portion of imagination in everything he did, even in his counting, in his measuring, and in his naming. Yeah. Yeah. And we call it impre imprecision, but this imagina imaginative part derived from various sources. One was his, him being a mensch and a complete yeah. human being with emotions, irritations, confusions, which doesn't fit the paradigm of Humboldtian science as can exactly. be but it leads us to uh, revising, I think, this very yeah. paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. And th the one thing you said then later, why did he maintain certain fictions, let's call it the imaginative element later in his letters and publications. And that again, of course, is a reminder that science is a social practice. And he, whatever he did was part of a social strategy of his, which is as such not illegitimate, but it surprises us. Once he came back from the Americas and started publishing, he wanted to cement his status as a, you know, celebrity, a world celebrity, and wanted to lend additional yeah. um, credibility to his findings, as faulty as they are. So, again, I want the point being that everything Professor Renner said is really food for thought for us. I think beyond the empirical findings and imprecision to. Um, begin in spite of all the research that is out there, begin rethinking Humboldt and what we think is his science. Thank you for coming. I should say for the others who are maybe still, who are still listening, Andreas uh, and I interacted in Munich last year and Andreas is working on a book on, on Humboldt. Uh, Andreas, only half of this talk was uh, what you heard earlier. The other half was completely new. I really did this analysis of the tide recently, but I, of course you are so right. We need to, rethink this concept, which was called concept of Humboldtian science, which will comes from the humanities, okay? And the humanities are not in the people working in the humanities, are not in the position to check the original data. This is where the natural scientists come in, such as myself. And we need to collaborate, okay? Humboldt was not the objective empiricist measuring everything. And, you know, as you just said, there was this imaginative part and he was less of an empiricist than the humanities have thought for, I don't know, 50 years maybe. And that's where the natural scientists come in. Thank you. So Carmen has another question. Yes. Hey. Was with grass zone referring to what we now refer to the paramo? Ah, this is also a very excellent question and is an addressed in a way by Pierre Moret and his paper and his colleagues. Humboldt does show Espeledia, a very famous Espeledia on the Chimborazo that occurs on the border with Colombia. But as Carmen Ulloa has pointed out, this is a tableau physique of these Andes, of the Andes. So he does show a famous paramo plant. He shows it kind of on the wrong, he shows it 
the Paramo is otherwise, other than mentioning Esculedia, not a big deal in his writings, but he does show a key Paramo plant in his Tableau Physique des Ondes. Thank you. Stefan asks, what may be the reason why that some species increased elevational distribution at Mount Tide, but not others? Ah, this is an excellent question. So of course, will be the focus or a focus in our paper. The biotic reasons, such as fewer goats, more rabbits, different composition of herbivores, and the temperature, and um, you know, numerous changes, because it is now a protected park, which it wasn't at the time when von Buch and Smith visited or Humboldt visited. So yes, there are many biotic factors that certainly influence whether plants are able to extend or change their altitudinal ranges, their occurrences is excellent. And we will have these data because the tide is so well researched, the vegetation and the climate, it is great. Bye. Thank you everybody.